Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. In today's special episode, we sat down with Kerry Gershanik, professor and author of political warfare and media warfare. We also hear from Joshua Phillip, host of Crossroads and senior investigative reporter at the Epoch Times. They touch on the Chinese regime's bid to take down America, not through traditional warfare, but something called unrestricted warfare. How that's playing out and what steps can be taken to counter a threat that may not even be seen. Let's dive in. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great to have you back on the show. Hey, Tiffany, always a pleasure. Thank you for having me back on, Tiffany. So recently in the news, there's these terms, unrestricted warfare and hybrid warfare, when it comes to how China kind of attacks the U.S. and allies. So to begin, how would you summarize these terms? Well, Tiffany, unrestricted warfare, you know, is the name of this paper written by four, two former Chinese colonels. Hybrid warfare is the idea of kind of combining different types of unconventional warfare. Uh, but really, when it comes to the CCP's like real tactics on this, this is what the idea is. It's how do you achieve the goals of war? Like, you know, what, what would you get if you were to conquer another country? Uh, maybe you gain control of their political system. Maybe you can gain control of their economy, their businesses. Maybe you gain control of the population through like media control or something like that. How do you obtain those exact same results through non-military means without engaging in troop on troop combat? That's what the idea of this type of warfare is. And so instead of engaging in troop on troop combat, where you know the CCP can look at America and say, okay, we can't meet them on a, in a head on, you know, head on head battle, but we can conquer them through other means. And so we can basically create the standards of conquering another nation uh, through, through non-military means. For example, uh, foreign investment for the Chinese Communist Party is regarded as a type of you know, strategic uh, tool. And so for the CCP, this is warfare. Media is warfare. Psychology, how you interpret information is warfare. Uh, legal battles are warfare. In fact, the CCP even has it adopted into its military code, uh, which is the three warfares doctrine. Media warfare, psychological warfare, and legal warfare. Uh, they have tools, for example, like the United Front, how to co-opt another country's leadership. How do you gain control of the influencers? How do you gain control of Hollywood? How do you gain control of the hearts and minds of a country? If you look at every single part of what makes a country function, of what makes a nation, whether it's businesses, whether it's academics, whether it's, you know, uh, let's say our institutions, whether it's you know, politicians or influencers or media personalities even, uh, the CCP has methods to target them. And for them, this is warfare to conquer another nation through non-military means. Basically, fighting without rules goes back thousands of years. And so this concept of unrestricted warfare is new to, say, those of us in democracies, because we work by the rules. We try to. We have international conventions. We have law. And, and we try to adhere to it to the best that we can, whether that be Japan, whether that be Taiwan, whether that be the United States of America or the European Union. We do try. Under unrestricted warfare, which is the thought process that is clearly guiding the Chinese Communist Party, there's no rules. There's no restraint. And so that's, that's what we mean by unrestricted warfare. Unrestricted warfare applies to all kinds of warfare, Tiffany. Kerry, you kind of mentioned the history of where these terms come from, but how far back does it go? Oh, you could go back to Clausewitz, or you could go back 2,000 years in Chinese history. Um, there's always references to where somebody used a stratagem, somebody, somebody did something that was unexpected by their, uh, their adversary. So you know, tr tracing it back to our modern history, the reason this becomes prominent in, on the, the Chinese Communist Party's radar screen um, is that in 1991, for the generation that wasn't born 30, three decades ago, 30 years ago, uh, we had the Gulf War. And in the Gulf War, the United States and the coalition partners uh, demonstrated devastating capability to use combined arms, uh, military uh, warfare, uh, command and control, uh, the, the satellites, everything that we brought to bear on every level, cyber, 
everything was brought to bear, and it was a crushing defeat for the Iraqi army, which was one of the largest militaries in the world at the time. This really caught the attention of the People's Liberation Army and, and, and the Central Military Commission and, and the Politburo because they had been sort of drifting along with this People's War concept and sort of slowly modernizing. But after 1991, the Gulf War uh, victory, the PLA and the CCP put a lot of effort into studying how the U.S. and the coalition partners won such a devastating victory, and number two, what they needed to do to defeat us, because the ultimate goal even then, as we, we well know, was to, to move the United States aside, not just move it aside as the, the world hegemon, to use their terminology, uh, but to, uh, to take that place and actually to destroy, defeat the United States of America. So that's why in 1999, eight years after the Gulf War, this book comes out, not as a doctrinal publication. It comes out more uh, through, through a publishing house that's really for PLA entertainment. But it resonates so powerfully in the Chinese Communist Party and the leadership and across China itself, because this is the means to defeat the United States of America. This, this uh, using any means available, then there was 24 different warfares listed, and that grew uh, over time beyond what the book stated. But we, we can beat the United States by asymmetrical means. Given how many different types of warfare there are, are there any specific examples that we're seeing play out now? Sure. Um, in Taiwan, one of the newer terms that, uh, that wasn't listed, incidentally, in the original 24 is cognitive warfare. So the, the PRC has uh, got a major uh, push uh, to, to win on the cognitive warfare battlefield. Now, we'll come back to terminology, Tiffany, because we, we tend to trip ourselves up. We come up with way too many terms. So let's focus in on cognitive warfare on Taiwan. Uh, a number of the news media organizations in Taiwan are run by people who are getting their funding from the People's Republic of China. And so you could, the stories that you read, the editorial stances that you see, Tiffany, could have been straight out of Xinhua, okay? Could have been straight off CCTV because, in effect, they are. The funding uh, that comes in, the funding that they use to, um, from advertising, for example, or they, they, uh, they'll, they'll use the business community uh, to affect uh, the, uh, the media organizations. For example, you could have a pro-Taiwan uh, newspaper, but if the people who are advertising in that newspaper are pro-PRC, they're going to say, fine, we'll pull our advertising, you'll go bankrupt, you'll go out of business. And what you see, and we have seen, both there and in other countries, is the newspaper, unfortunately, through moral cowardice, uh, bends. The newspaper will say, okay, fine, we'll change our editorial stance. We want to stay in business. We have mouths to feed. So that's, that's a little bit of lawfare. That's a little bit of, um, it's a little bit of media warfare or public opinion warfare. Psychological operations. The large number of aircraft incursions uh, in the, the ta Taiwan ADIZ, or Defense Identification Zone, that's psychological warfare. That's designed to wear down the people of Taiwan. It's designed to wear down the pilots and the commanders and the troops of the airmen in Taiwan because they're the ones that have to scramble all the time to respond to this. So psychologically, they're grinding down, or they're attempting to grind down the people and the armed forces of Taiwan through that particular psychological warfare operation. There's many more. If you, if you actually read, uh, which I do, the English versions of China Daily and uh, PLA Daily and um, uh, Xinhua and a number of other publications, you can see there's a relentless barrage every day of psychological warfare directed against Japan, psychological warfare directed against the Philippines, so, uh, psychological warfare directed against the, the countries of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Um, it's relentless and it is global, but the psychological warfare is, is a very big element of those three pillars as well. 
So it sounds like basically winning a battle without even having to go to war and do the traditional kind of fighting. So what are some examples of maybe how we're seeing this play out, especially in America? Well, Tiffany, one of the big one of the big methods that's playing out is what they call the uh, United Front Work Department. Uh, the United Front Work Department is it, it's a branch of the Chinese Communist Party. First of all, uh, Mao Zedong called it the magic one of the magic weapons of the CCP. And the United Front Work Department is a system, a government agency meant to infiltrate foreign countries, establish networks of influence, and co-opt the leadership or influencers of that country. And so, for example, um, United Front works through what they call tongs. Tongs are like fraternal organizations, guilds, uh, family name associations. These tongs are like the unofficial governing bodies of Chinese communities. I mean, some are good, some are bad. Uh, they're not all the same. The United Front targets them. Once they target them, they gain control of them. They gain control of that entire network, sometimes tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people, depending what it is. Uh, one of the big examples of this is like in New York, we have the uh, Fukian American Association. Fukian American Association is one also tied to one of the largest organized crime groups in the world. Uh, that's the Fuk Ching Gang, one of the biggest human traffickers like in the world, not even just in the U.S. Fuk Ching Gang is also one of the CCP's major kind of influenced tongs. Fu and uh, of course, the, uh, the Fukian American Association works as one of their arms to get into political circles and so on. And so they might, for example, go to your local city council member and then do something as simple as inviting them on a trip back to China. He goes on a trip to China, comes back and starts going on TV, talking about how great the CCP is. Behind the scenes, of course, there's been things done to co-opt that official gradually. Sometimes it's through, let's say, uh, blackmail. Sometimes it's through money. Sometimes it's something as simple as just gradually changing their perspectives. Once they do that, they'll start creating policies and taking actions that are in line with the interests of the Chinese Communist Party. And so even though they're like a U.S. official, they begin acting as an, as an extension or someone in the interest of the CCP. And that's the goal of this. And Kerry, out of these dozens of different warfares, which one would be the most dangerous but maybe unseen threat to America? The United Front operations, where they, they get American institutions, our education institutions, and when we're talking Harvard, we're talking Stanford, we're talking Ivy League institutions and the big names, when they co-opt them through grants um, and where you have professors, you have researchers self-censoring because they know, you know there's a price to pay if you don't self-censor about what you're saying about the PRC, um, that elite capture of academia, of our politicians, of the, through the United Front operations, that's, that's incredibly serious threat because it's very insidious. It's our own people turning on us in Taiwan, in the United States. So we need to ferret that out and name and shame and prosecute uh, if we have the right laws to prosecute. But the other way that they reach us is uh, we're a highly tech-savvy, you know, Taiwan, especially tech-savvy, the United States. Everyone's got their face in their, their iPhones. Everyone's on uh, a different social media platform. And so the, um, the cognitive warfare coming at us through uh, the, 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 the online, uh, through the internet, uh, the way that's bombarding us through deep fakes, the way it's uh, bombarding us through disinformation, propaganda. Um, and and it's, it, it's done in such a way that a lot of people don't even know that they're doing it. Do you realize, Tiffany, that the PRC even uses TikTok uh, video games and other video games, because so many of the video games are developed in the PRC, as indoctrination tools? That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for more than a year. Our full episode can be watched on our partner platform, Appbox TV. To sign up for a free 14-day trial, please click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer, and see you tomorrow.